Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Marketer of the Day podcast. We are here with David Meerman Scott, and we're gonna talk today about the new rules of marketing and PR. We're gonna talk about fanocracy. We're gonna talk about the real-time marketing revolution and how you can get that human connection in your business and make an impact and change the world and build things up and get everything that you ever wanted and more. So David, glad to be talking to you. Holy cow, that was a hell of a lead in. <laughs> Thanks very a much, lot to live up to. It's, exactly, it's awesome to be here. Well, it's glad to have you here. And just so that people can kind of follow along and see what you're all about while we're talking, do you feel like dropping a link and tell us where people can find you online? Sure. Uh, the, my brand new book is called Fanocracy. So www.fanocracy.com is a great spot. On the socials, I'm DM Scott, D-M-S-C-O-T-T. Perfect. DM Scott on the socials and fanocracy.com. So uh, I feel like I, I should know what this term fanocracy means just <laughs> by hearing it. It's got my attention, but I feel like I do need an explanation. So what the heck is fanocracy and how can it help us? Cool. So um, yeah, it's a word that, that we kind of made up. So um, I, um, I'm, it's totally fine. You haven't heard it before. The idea of a fanocracy is when fans rule. So a democracy, the rule by the many, a meritocracy ruled by those with most ability, a monarchy ruled by the, the ruling party, uh, the ruling family. Uh, a fanocracy is when the fans rule. And I co-wrote it with my daughter, Reiko. She's 26. And um, so we, we teamed up and we looked at the idea of we are massive fans of the things we love. I love live music. I've been to 780 live concerts and she loves Harry Potter. Um, she's read every book, seen every movie and wrote a 90,000 word alternative ending to the Harry Potter series where Draco Malfoy is a spy for the Order of the Phoenix and put that onto a fan fiction site that's been downloaded thousands of times. So we wanted to explore does this idea of fandom apply beyond the ideas of entertaining? You know, live music for me, Harry Potter for Reiko. And in fact, it does. We found all kinds of examples. And so we've spent the last five years researching, researching and writing how anybody can use the ideas of fandom to market a business. Sounds exciting again. And that, that is uh, something that would be great to tap into sometimes, right? Like you see how many people get so excited about things like Harry Potter and you think, well, that's great for them. And, and also it seems like, it, especially on the social networks, people are really excited about some TV show, movie, celebrity, and you think, well, I'd like to tap into that, but also I, I have things to sell. I have a business and I want to get people excited about my app or my platform or my book. So like how do how do you get from the entertainment fandom to this more businessy fandom? So the subtitle of the book is turning fans into customers and customers into fans. So we actually looked at two different broad ideas around using fandom for business. And the first idea is how can you kind of do what you just described. How can you tap into existing fandoms and get those people to be your customers? And then we also looked at how can you have your business and turn them into fans of you exactly the same way that people are fans of, say, Harry Potter. And both of those things um, absolutely are, are possible. There's actually prescriptions for doing so that we, that we talk about. So let's take a look first at this idea of turning fans into customers. Um, Robert, do you love auto insurance? No. No. <laughs> I've asked that of 3,000 people, and everyone says no. <laughs> One person said, insurance sucks. I hate insurance. And he was the CEO of an auto insurance company. His nice. name is Mikhail Haggerty, uh, and he runs a business called Haggerty Insurance. What he said to me is, David, everyone hates my business. Not only do they hate to buy auto insurance, hate to spend money on auto insurance, they hate to use our product because it meant they crashed their car. And he said, there's no way that I wanted to build a business based on either discounting 
or advertising, which is what everyone else in my business does, you know, like the, the, the gecko or the lizard or the whatever the hell it is that the other guys use. Um, so he focuses on classic car auto insurance. And so when he started the business, he started to go to classic car shows. That's where the fans of classic cars are, classic car shows. And he started to, um, then as he'd started to grow his business, he brought his employees and they would set up booths and they would interact with people at these shows. They would then become experts in things like how much cars are worth and they have valuation reports that they provide for free. They have a YouTube channel with a million follower, a uh, million subscribers. They have a Haggerty's Drivers Club with 650,000 members. They've tapped into the fandom that already exists around classic cars, they're now the largest classic car insurer in the world. They'll grow by 200,000 new customers this year. Their customers love them. When you go to classic car shows, people wearing the Haggerty cap, people wearing the Haggerty t-shirts, people have the Haggerty sticker on their bumper, their bumper sticker of their classic car. They've done a fabulous job with it and they're in a business that everybody hates. And so what's the, the takeaway from that? What did they do, right? Because I'm hearing from you that they, they niched down, right? They, they uh, drilled into something specific, they differentiated, and they really got to know that existing fandom. So that way they, they understood their concerns, uh, learned their language, kind of buddied up to them. But what would you say that they did correctly that, say, like, the gecko isn't? Well, the, the main thing they did um, is they recognized that it's not about their product or service. And that's the thing that's really hard for marketers and entrepreneurs of all kinds, because we naturally fall in love with our products or services. Uh, and the other guys all focus on, you know, we've got the best car insurance. We've got the cheapest car insurance. We've got the cutest gecko, whatever it is. Um, and what Haggerty said was, no, it's not about our insurance. It's about, our fans. It's about the people who love classic cars. It's about providing as much value as possible to this tribe of people who already exist. Um, and that's something that any one of us can do is tie into a group of people that already exist um, and providing things of tremendous value. You know, in the Haggerty's case, a YouTube channel, valuation reports, they have a, a, a bi-monthly magazine they send out. So this is all proven to be extremely valuable. Um, and so, I, I mean, I just love the fact that they're in a business everyone hates though, because it, it, in my mind, that proves that these ideas work for any kind of organization. And it, and it seems like that thought process there is, going back to the, those marketing basics, right? Like it's really easy to be so in it, to be so just deep in your own company that you, you think that the things you care about or what they care about, and sure, you might be excited about how you're running this silly, crazy discount because that's your own business, but that just seems to be real like kind of commodity-based, feature-based kind of stuff. What's more exciting are getting to know those people, getting to know what they, they care about, and then make sure that we really understand this concept. Uh, can we maybe hit this from another angle? Because like sure. we got that classic car example. Have you worked with some other client where like they were just completely stuck? They had, they had no idea how to make it interesting, fun, exciting, and you kind of maybe tried some things, worked your magic, and figured out a way through? Well, um, I, didn't, I have not come at this from a consultant perspective because it's more around doing the research and writing the book uh, and finding examples all over the world. Um, and then figuring out a prescription that people can apply. So what I can tell you is we've got the nine ideas of how to grow fandom and, and all of them are interesting and different. Um, and we've run across people who've actually applied some of them. And I'm gonna share with you one now that I find to be the most fascinating. It's actually really applicable for what we're doing right this moment. And I've had dozens of people who tell me they've applied it and have, it's been incredibly successful. And that is this. Uh, my daughter, Reka, who I mentioned as my co-author, is a neuroscientist. She did a neuroscience degree at Columbia University as undergraduate. She's now in her final year of medical school. So one of the things that we focused on is looking, doing a deep dive into what's going on in our brains when we become a fan of something. What's actually happening from a neuroscience perspective? And we interviewed neuroscientists about this. It turns out that within neuroscience, there's this concept of proximity, humans being proximate to one another. And that's where the most powerful relationships happen. 
the closer that humans get to one another. And what we recognized about the idea of fandom is that, yeah, I love the Grateful Dead. Yeah, I love live music. My daughter loves Harry Potter. But what it's really about when it, you really dig underneath all the layers of the onion is that the people who do that with us are among our best friends. We're having a really strong human connection to the people who share a fandom with us because we're part of a tribe. We learn the lingo, we learn the rituals, and that becomes really, really important. Like if, if Reiko meets another Harry Potter fan, immediately asks, what's your house? You know, and everyone knows what that means and it, it, it's a way of bonding. So this idea of proximity is interesting. There's a neuroscientist named Edward T. Hall who looked at um, three different zones of proximity. There's the public space further than 20 feet away. Then there's social space, 20 feet to four feet. And then there's personal space, four feet or, more, or closer. Now, hardwired into our brains as humans is the idea that the closer you get to someone, the more powerful the shared emotions. So if you get in social space within 20 feet, that's that sort of you walk into a room, there's other people in the room. If you know those people, it's a very strong experience. If you don't know them, um, your fight or flight instinct kicks in. That can be a negative experience, even more so at personal space, four feet or closer. At a cocktail party situation where you know people, very, very strong positive reactions. Get into a crowded elevator, you don't know people, it's hardwired in our brains, we feel nervous because we don't know those people. Uh, it's part of our, our survival instinct. So what this means for entrepreneurs who wanna build fans, how much can you put people in close proximity to one another? So can you, for example, like Haggerty, go to classic car events and meet people and be in close physical proximity? But some people say, David, I, I run a virtual business or my business is global or I can't possibly get in close physical proximity with all, all of our customers. There's another concept of neuroscience called mirror neurons. That's the part of our brain that fires when we see somebody or hear somebody do something as if we're doing it ourselves. Robert, I'm going to demonstrate. I've got a lemon in one hand and a slice of lemon in the other hand. And those of you who are listening only, imagine a, a, I have a lemon and a slice of lemon in my hand. And I'm now gonna take a little bite of this slice of lemon. And as I take a little bit of a bite of this slice of lemon, immediately my eyes close, my, my mouth puckers up, my saliva starts to do its thing. It's a really strong sensation to take a bite out of a lemon, really powerful. My brain is firing, but I would suggest that everybody listening, and especially Robert who saw that on the video camera, is experiencing in their brain a little bit of biting into a lemon. Right, Robert? Are you feeling that a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. It felt sour to me. It's weird, right? It's really interesting. That's mirror neurons. So the idea of mirror neurons can be used by entrepreneurs who want to grow fans to combine the idea of using video and photographs with the idea of close physical proximity. What this means is that if you use video and photos in your marketing, if you use video and photos in your social networking, on your website and in other places, um, and it's cropped as if you're about four feet away, which is personal space, sort of cocktail party distance. Our brain signal to us that you're actually in the same room four feet away from that person. Our brains can't help it. That mirror neuron begins to fire. And this is exactly why you think you know movie stars and television stars and why people become massive fans of movie stars and television stars. It's because you feel you know them because your mirror neurons kink in and say, I've seen them on the screen, therefore I know them. You don't know them, they're, they're an image on a screen. So we can use this in our marketing. We can use this as entrepreneurs. It's fabulously powerful. I, um, one person read a very early copy of the book about three months ago before it came out, um, and she's a novelist, well-known novelist. Um, and she has an Instagram and she, um, she writes her, sets her novels in Europe. And, and most of her Instagram photos are of architecture and, and scenes in Europe. 
She has a good following on her Instagram. She said she had never, ever taken a selfie before. And a selfie, of course, is four feet away approximately or a little bit less because that's how long your arm is. So she read this idea that um, about mirror neurons in proximity, took a selfie, posted her very first selfie. It got more engagement than any um, Instagram post she had ever done. She was like, oh my gosh, I get it. This idea of proximity, this idea of mirror neurons. Um, so I know that was a long riff, my friend, Robert, but that, that's the idea of how we can use neuroscience and one of the ideas within this concept of fanocracy to get closer to our customers, either physically or virtually, and then have those people believe that is powerful connection. I'm a fan. And, and that's really great. And, and I, can, I can tell that, that you thought a lot of these things through in your book that maybe we, once you point them out, we say, well, of course, I've noticed that, but I wasn't able to actually be consciously aware of it. And what you're making me think of is, um, I don't know, like there's always a, like a handful of people, even excluding celebrities, movie stars, even just like, you know, people I know on Facebook, marketing people. And sometimes I'll, there'll be people that maybe I see once or twice a year at networking events, and I'll feel like I've been hanging out with them all year long because I see them on live streams, I see them on videos, and I, it's kind of a spooky thing, right? How it's like you feel like you, you've you known the person the whole time, and maybe you're, you've met them now for the first time, and, and now because there's a lot more video than there used to be, there's not that disconnect. Like, I don't know if you experienced this, but maybe even up until to 10 years ago, once you finally met someone who you'd known online, you met them at a conference or something, they were way different as far as like the, the personality, body language, maybe they were so animated on the, the rehearsed, prepared video, but now that we're expected to live stream pretty regularly or be on YouTube, now there's more of what you see is what you get. And, and yeah, it's almost like, that, that time that you spend apart from the person you're not even apart, you're still just kind of right there in the room with them. I think that's exactly right. And um, of course, I, I, I knew that this concept was, was kind of out there based because I had experienced exactly what you described. You know, I, I knew people who used photographs a lot or used video a lot. And I, and, when I, and exactly what you said, when I would see them at a conference, I'd feel like, wow, yeah, you know, it feels like we had a cocktail together last week, when, it, when in fact, maybe we had never even met before. But learning what's actually going on in our brains, what the, what the actual neuroscience behind this is, and the idea that we can't help ourselves, it's hardwired in our brain, it's a survival technique, um, the ideas of proximity, the ideas of mirror neurons, um, means that when you know this information, and I've just provided a, enough information to, that you can run with it, it's not, there's not, nothing else behind it, it's a pretty simple concept, but anybody can think to themselves, well, yeah, okay, maybe I should be using more photographs, maybe I should be using more video than I am now. So uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to get your product or service off the ground, you know, photos and videos, incredibly powerful. Um, if, you're, um, uh, if you're trying to find a new job, photos and videos, incredibly powerful. Uh, no matter what it is you're trying to accomplish, this stuff's really powerful. And the, that's just one idea. There's others that we've identified and written about. But to me, that's one of my favorites, just because it's rooted in science and all of us recognize it, but very few of us are actually using it in a conscious way as a technique. And, and uh, I, have, I, I only noticed how helpful video was until I began using it a lot more recently. Like it used to be if I was going to meet with someone, we do a phone call, we do Skype, and now it's video chat. And I didn't yeah. think much of it at first, but it makes such a difference. Like just so much more is communicated. And even of us talking right now, we're doing the podcast, we're only recording audio, but we're on, on video just because it helps to feel like we're talking to a real person, like we're in the room, we pick up on each other's body language, we know when we should uh, to keep talking or not, the flow's a lot better. And al along those lines, you said that you had like uh, something fun to mention in regards to that. Bef right before we started talking, you said that there was something about the being on camera and all that that kind of was interesting, right? 
Well, I mean, I think, I think, I don't remember what I was thinking of, but, but the whole idea of how powerful this is, um, you know, and, and you're right, you and I are right now, we're on a video camera so we can see each other, which is amazing. Um, and this technology has become incredibly powerful just in the few years. And it's been around for a while, but it was really slow and clunky and the internet connections weren't fast enough and, you know, they're hard to use. And, you know, the, the systems you had to like download software and stuff, but now it's really powerful. Um, and so I just think the idea of using it more is really, really important. Well, I agree. And so to, to give us a little more of a taste of the book in these last few minutes as we're winding down, is there an interesting nugget or concept that you, can, you think we can fit into these last few minutes to really whet people's appetite so that way they go and run and get the book? Anything uh, coming to mind just about something really quick but interesting? Sure. Um, another concept I found fascinating is the idea, um, which we titled the chapter, Let Go of Your Creations. The idea here is once you put a product or service out into the world, you have to let the fans take over. You no longer own it. You have to let the fans choose how they talk about it. You have to let the fans choose how they interact with it. You have to let the fans choose the ways that they organize themselves around it. And um, for example, going back to Harry Potter, there's a website called MuggleNet. And we interviewed um, uh, the person who founded and, and, and has run MuggleNet. And that has nothing to do with J.K. Rowling, the author of, of the Harry Potter series, and everything to do with fans organizing around something. I'll give you two examples from the business world. The first one is Adobe. They make Photoshop software, among other uh, software products. And my daughter, Reiko, my co-author, loves to make art using Photoshop. And she and her friends get online and, and they participate um, in blogs, chat rooms, and, and, and video tutorials and stuff to learn as much as they can about how to do better art using Photoshop. But Adobe, the company that makes Photoshop software, they all laugh at Adobe because they try to control the way that people talk about their software rather than losing control and letting the fans take over. They don't let go of their creations. What they say is you cannot say that you Photoshopped something. Adobe says you can't say that. You must say that you manipulated something using Adobe trademark circle R Photoshop trademark circle R software. And, and Reiko, my daughter said, you know, everything that Adobe wants us to say sounds like a robot, but everything that we say sounds like a fan. So the, the, the idea here is to let your fans say that how, to work, how, to, how to talk about your products and service. Let go of your creations. An organization that's done a good job with that is iRobot. They make the Roomba vacuum cleaners. And um, there's this whole subculture of people who take videos of their pets riding on the Roombas. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but go to YouTube and just do a search on Roomba cats or Roomba dogs, you'll find them. There's millions and millions and millions of views of these videos. iRobot, the company that makes the Roomba, could say, this is not approved use of our product. You can't do this, take down these videos. But they let the fans take over. They let go of their creations. So we as entrepreneurs naturally feel like, oh my God, this is my baby. I own it. I want to control how people talk about it. You can't. You've got to let the fans take over. That's a great story. And you, you have my, my brain swirling with all kinds of ideas for uh, how I can implement the, this sort of thing. And I mean, it makes sense why Adobe would do with what they're doing because they don't want their trademark Photoshop to become generic, like how people always said uh, Kleenex this, and they always said, you know, this is a, a Kleenex, and now every, that just becomes the common usage of, it, usage of it. But you think that's a good thing, right? If everyone says, I Photoshop this, that means that that's the default term. And so it's like one of those things where it's like you have to sometimes give up the short term safe thing you're hanging on to in order to get something more long term. And also from these, uh, these examples you're giving me, it seems like there's like an always an interesting story built in, right? Like, yeah, we're talking, got, um, they talk about what's been photoshopped, for example. Ex exactly. We've got um, something like 30 or 40 stories in the book. I'd like to give you one example from my own world. If I may, it's very short. Yeah. I, inv I invented a concept called newsjacking. Newsjacking is when you write an instant blog post or YouTube or create a YouTube video um, based on your expertise being in demand because there's something breaking in the news 
um, that you can um, be an, that you're an expert in. And it's a great way to get media attention. I invented this concept 10 years ago. And um, when I, and so the new, word newsjacking had never been used like this before. Um, so I own the URL newsjacking, but I did not trademark it. I let anyone who wanted to use that term. If you wanted to write a book about newsjacking, go ahead, and somebody did. If you want to do speeches about newsjacking, go ahead, and many people did. If you want to create blogs about newsjacking, go ahead, and thousands of people have done that. So everybody talking about the concept I invented, became, it became so popular. Every single day people are talking about it. It's now listed in the Oxford English Dictionary, and my name is attached to it. And anyone who Googles the word newsjacking, I'm at the top because I own newsjacking.com. I'm doing the exact same thing with fanocracy. I did not trademark the word fanocracy. I did not try to assert my ownership over the word fanocracy. Yes, I invented it. Yes, I own the URL. Yes, yes, I have a book with a title, Fanocracy. But I'd rather have people talking about it freely than try to control it. Because I'd rather have I'd rather have someone else write a book with the word fanocracy in the title than not. I'd rather have other people give speeches about it than not because it spreads the idea far and wide, which eventually comes back to me and makes me that much bigger. So this idea is hard for people to get their arms around because many times the legal team, like in the case of, of, of Adobe, I'm sure that's what happened. The legal team says, oh, no, 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 that's not the right way to do it. Well, sometimes the legal team might be wrong. You know, it's like, let the ideas spread, like, let people, let go of your creations, let the fans take over. It, well, it's, uh, it's abundance thinking, not scarcity thinking. It's like the, the John Rockefeller saying of, instead of one person doing, uh, putting in 100%, I'd rather have 100 people putting in 1%. Well, with this whole fanocracy concept, why not have 100,000 put in 0.001%. And we, we, so uh, the, a lot of this makes sense, you know, let, let your, uh, your concept catch fire and let it, let it spread. But how do you make sure that uh, in, in letting go of it and, you know, giving up control of it, how do you make sure that it, it gets back to you and you can uh, make money and get recognized? How do you keep that factor in, in play? Well, in the case of a concept, like in my case, it's a concept. Uh, I made sure that I kept it under wraps until I was ready to birth it. So um, I, can't, uh, I started writing this book five years ago and I, um, I, uh, um, I, with my daughter and we came up with the title approximately two years ago. We didn't announce the title to the world until about six months prior to the publication in January of 2020 of the book. Um, I made sure I owned the, UR, the URL, newsjacking.com and fanocracy.com long before um, I, I, I talked about the idea publicly. But, but what I wanted to do was make sure that once I announced this concept to the world, that I already had lined up the book contract, the manuscript was at the publisher, we already had a cover art chosen. Um, I had already started to give speeches, you know, I was ready to give speeches on the topic. Um, and so once I announced it, then Google took over. I have the URL, I've given speeches, I have the book, there's the Amazon listing, all that stuff. So I have the top search results. Um, and, and so even though other people, I want to talk about it. Like, for example, when you do a listing um, for this podcast, perhaps you'll use, use the word fanocracy and Google will find that. There'll be another listing for that word fanocracy. Um, uh, and that's all great. Um, and so I think that it's a matter of, in my case at least, birthing something new. It's a matter of making sure that before I announce it to the world that I already had um, the social proof that I'm the founder of this movement established. Um, and, I, and if somebody really big were to take it on, let's say, I don't know, let's just take for, say for argument's sake, Apple created a product called Fanocracy. They would probably beat me in the search engine, but that would be really cool if, <laughs> if Apple did that and I would love it. 
Okay, so so you're you're saying that you're uh, you you had certain strategic things in place. So you you said you know I'll I'll, I'll create this chaos. I'll, I'll create this movement, but then also have a few things in my back pocket so that way uh, you know the the things are in motion, right? The the books in motion, the speaking gigs in motion, so that way right. you're not doing that sort of thing too early, so that no no one else can hijack it. And even if if like a, a huge company hijacks it, that's a good thing. Yeah, that's the way I look at it. And, and that's a very counterintuitive way of looking at it because almost all entrepreneurs will do the opposite. They'll say, I own this. I'm going to trademark it. I'm going to make it a registered trademark. And I'm going to have my legal team make sure other people don't use it. Um, and I think there might be some occasions where that's appropriate. But for a lot of things in today's world, especially things around ideas, um, that, that's in my mind, at least, and, and maybe I'm an outlier, but in my mind, at least that's not the right approach because if you want fans, if you want people talking about you, if you want people saying you are talking about your ideas all over the world, you have to let them talk. And as soon as you slap a trademark on something, you're saying to them, you do not have permission to talk. So this is, seems like a good option for us to consider if it's appropriate. And you you hear about companies like putting things in open source or GPL or Elon Musk made a lot of his patents public domain. So sometimes th this is a really good idea, a really good thing for us to do in order to get people talking, in order to get that that fanocracy started. So just to uh, to go back and make sure that people can get the book and find your website, where can and where should people go? after they've heard our conversation here and were intrigued by all these ideas we've been throwing out today. Well, first of all, Robert, great example on Elon Musk and his patents. Um, I, I had known about that, but I, I hadn't even thought of that as an example of losing, letting go of your creation. So I appreciate that because- Put, put um, it in the I, sequel, put it I, in yeah, Fanocracy right. no, too, I, right? No, I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, it's a fabulous example and you're absolutely right. And it's exactly exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I've got the website at www.fanocracy.com. There's videos, there's um, uh, PDF documents you can download. None of them require registration. Um, on the social networks, I am DM Scott, D-M-S-C-O-T-T. -T. And if you want to learn more about me, um, my full name, David Meerman Scott, I'm the only, I use my middle name professionally because I'm the only David Meerman Scott on the entire planet. So if you Google me, you'll get me. Fantastic. So DM Scott on social media. And I love David that you said, Nierman, Scott. I love that you said fantastic. <laughs> Ooh, that, that's good. Uh, some subliminal <laughs> messaging there. And then fanocracy.com is the place to go and check out those handouts, uh, get the book, go ahead and get it. If you want to start a movement, if you want your business to catch on fire, if you want your ideas to spread and you should want all those things, run, don't walk to fanocracy.com. Get the book and we'll see you there. And thanks David for stopping by and being generous with your time and really getting us thinking about uh, some of these real new amazing ideas. I love it. Thanks, Robert. I really appreciate you having me on and love the fact that you've been podcasting so regularly. So keep up the work. Will do. All right. So the recording's